I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History MA program here at Columbia. Um, tonight's event is the third in our semester-long series on oral history in the city. Um, and so part of what we're asking is what can oral history tell us, which is such a small-scale, one-on-one, labor-intensive process about something at the scale of a city or even a neighborhood or even a block. Um, and so we're looking around for examples of projects that had scaled up oral history and did not have to look very far um, to the New York Public Library's Community Oral History Project, um, which is really setting um, new standards and new procedures and creating new digital tools um, to be able to do oral history in a professional and a quality way um, at a scale that actually like, has the potential to allow us to know something about a city. And um, I was playing with the database today and, you know, doing some term searching and finding, you know, all this, just all kinds of really interesting it's stuff. Interesting field. Um, and so how many interviews are in there now? 1,250. 1,250 life histories of New Yorkers. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, mm -hmm. By way of a more formal introduction, Alexander Kelly is the manager of adult programming and outreach services at the New York Public Library, where she introduced and now directs the New York Public Library Community Oral History Project. Previously, she worked as a facilitator at StoryCorps and received an MA from the School of Media Studies at the New School. She's also coordinated several youth media projects around the city, including an oral history project in Crown Heights, the Engage Media Lab program at New School, and the documentary filmmaking project at Brooklyn Children's Museum. Um, I also want to mention that this is part of the Paul F. Lazarsfeld Lecture Series, and we're grateful for that support. Um, and I'm going to pass around a sign-in sheet if anyone's here who is not on our mailing list and would like to be. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I'll turn it over to you and welcome everyone. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you, Amy, and the Oral History Masters Program for inviting me to speak. Um, you all are my teachers. I'm really, really looking forward, most of all, to the Q&A at the end of this, um, when you can ask me tons of questions about this project that I still very much consider a pilot, even though it's been going on for three years. <laughs> Um, I actually don't even come from an oral history background per se, um, although I did get training from Suzanne Snyder, who many, many of you know at the New School. Um, still learning about it, and so I really admire all of your work and your dedication to the field and look forward to hearing what you have to teach me about this project after I finish sharing more details. Um, so let's actually start with the question, who here is doing a community-based oral history project or has done a community-based oral history project in the past? Okay, a <laughs> couple hands. What was your community-based oral history project done? Uh, well, it, it has really yet to begin, um, but I'm hoping to do um, basically yeah, a series of, of community-based oral history projects in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, because I went down there this summer to do field work for a biography that I'm trying to involve one person that grew up there. Mm -hmm. and so much more to be said for like the, like the social fabric that you came out of. Um, yeah. So. so when you're thinking about a community oral, community based oral history project, the idea behind it is that it's done by the community members of the community members. These are the, the kind of interview or narrator pairing. Um, very, very grassroots model, people's history style model, um, something that this oral history project at the library that I'm about to tell you about aspires to kind of get to the point where we can say that community members around the city of New York have really taken the library's suggestion and done this oral history project on their own, community by community. Um, Barb Summer, many of you know, has written quite a bit about the idea of community oral history. And I think it's actually really interesting just to look at how she defines community-based oral history. And I crossed off a couple of things that don't apply to the oral history project at the New York Public Library, just because at NYPL we have the benefit of really being supported by an institution on this work, which many community-based oral history projects, especially in smaller communities around the country and the world, really don't have the opportunity um, to have right now. 
Um, so a couple of other things that I just want to mention is that oftentimes community-based oral history projects are driven by volunteers, no different for the NYPL project. I'm the only paid staff person for this project. Um, oftentimes there are limited funds, also no different for the NYPL project. And I wouldn't say the last point actually is too limiting in this case. Um, sometimes uh, in working on projects, it's really tempting to say that the funds will limit us from getting a lot done, from interviewing a lot of people. But um, I'd like to think more optimistically about that. Um, we often partner with local businesses, but it's not necessarily to provide support and supplies. Um, we don't necessarily need that at the library right now. Um, we're thankful enough to have recording equipment. I have 30 recorders sitting in my office for people to use. Um, we oftentimes partner with people on programs. So just a little bit of clarification around um, the traditional definition of community-based. I would say we're a community-driven oral history project. Um, we'd like to think that people will pick it up in the communities that we work with and make it community-based. So, I'm going to share a little bit about this, how this project kind of came to be. Um, I'm going to take you through its story. I'll tell you a lot about the Jefferson Market or Oral History Project, which is where this all started in Greenwich Village. And then we'll talk a little bit about how it's kind of hard to define this, this project model as a model. I kind of rebel against that, that program in a box standpoint, um, where you can use one kind of written document and pass it around a system of 88 branches of the library and it's all going to work out fine. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the intricacies that have been involved within each neighborhood as we've introduced a very, very similar model to what we started with at Jefferson Market. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that came up in the session that we just had, actually. So it'll be good to kind of revisit those and I'll add more insight. Um, some of the roadblocks, some of the ways that, as Amy just mentioned, um, when you're scaling up a project like this, when you're scaling up a really, really quality interview between two people in a neighborhood and inviting hundreds of people to do that, um, what are some of the methodological and ethical considerations around that, and how are we asking those questions every day at the library? So, who here has been to your local library in the past two months? Okay, I like to see that. That's <laughs> good. Um, what, what have you done at the library? Borrowed books. <laughs> Borrowed books, okay, that's good. Anything else? I want to have a card, but they said that I need a little pool for the university. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, you're thinking about getting a car. That's, that's awesome. Um, so that's really great. Uh, you know, the library is in a really, really interesting space right now. Um, and it's one of those spaces uh, where we're really repositioning ourselves um, in a lot of communities around the city who are using us in very, very different ways. Um, like I said, the NYPL has 88 branches. We're in Manhattan. We're in the Bronx. We're in Staten Island. Um, let me just back up and say that thinking about the different stakeholders in this NYPL oral history project, I really just want to start with the library and why a project like this is important at the library level um, before I move on to the other more obvious stakeholders in any community driven oral history project, which would be the actual participants, narrators, and interviewers, um, as well as researchers later on who are going to be using this material. So we're starting out with the library, okay? So you probably have all um, heard a little bit about the research going on. Um, Pew Research Center has done all sorts of stuff on how people are using the library now and how people expect to use the library. And a couple of things that I just kind of recently revisited that I thought would be interesting to mention today is that a significant percent of the public that was interviewed for this poll sees libraries as being ideal spaces to promote a sense of community within their local area and also serve as a gathering place for addressing challenges in their local community. Um, so thinking about the library as a neutral space where people can come in and bring oftentimes challenging dialogue um, from many different points of view, I think is something that the Oral History Project 
really provides the opportunity to bring. Um, another thing that we're working at at the library is bringing in new patrons. Um, you know, as you know, great that you're checking out books. A lot of people aren't checking out books anymore, and we want to figure out ways that new patrons who are 65 or older, and then between 25 and 40, key kind of sweet spot age demographics, that a, an oral history project has the potential to attract. Um, we also want to create high immersion programming. So an oral history project has the potential to do this because it's the type of project that allows people to sustain involvement. It's not just drop in, drop out, unless you want to make it that way. You can stay committed to this project for six to seven months in each of the neighborhoods where it's at. Um, the other thing, and this is kind of interesting, this is something that was unanticipated at the beginning of this project in 2013, but there's interdepartmental collaboration that happens throughout the library like you've never seen with this oral history project. People from the research collections where these oral histories will eventually be kept in a repository. Um, people from the digital library where these or uh, oral histories are currently being kept on our website. And people from my department, the Outreach Services and Adult Programming Department um, where you know, we create programs to bring new adults into the library. So, um, other types of buzzwords that this oral history project supports, programming, I already mentioned that, public advocacy, thinking about all of the opportunities for governmental officials to come into the library and, and support these projects, um, and then partnerships, another key word. Okay, so it's obvious what these projects could potentially do for the library. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what they do for the people involved, um, which is obvious in some ways on that micro level for many of you who've worked in oral history. You kind of experience the benefits of seeing somebody who's being listened to for the first time, maybe, in this way in their lives. Um, or maybe somebody on the other side of it who is, is interviewing somebody for the first time. So there's these obvious personal benefits. Um, but I also just want to mention on the neighborhood level, um, bringing up that idea of this cross-community dialogue that happens in these changing communities, and I'm saying changing, um, we talked about this word earlier, um, because library likes to keep it kind of on a neutral level, um, but our city is being gentrified right now. I mean, lots of changes, lots of things that are happening in every single neighborhood, micro neighborhood. And so we want to create the opportunity for people who are coming from many different backgrounds to be able to talk um, and to be able to challenge each other. And that can happen in a rural history project. Um, you all have heard of Michael Frisch, probably, um, the shared authority guy. Um, so this oral history project, uh, I think, very much embodies all of this stuff around the community curated exhibit and kind of the trend around creating opportunities for people, patrons, we call them at the library, to be able to um, basically bring their areas of expertise to the library space. So instead of the library just providing a service to them, they become service providers for the library. And there's a shared creation in community space and community resources. So I thought it would be interesting too, you know, when people were first kind of taking part in this project, we did an evaluation of sorts and we asked people what their favorite part of the project was. And so some of these things were kind of unexpected, but some of them were really tied to this idea of, you know, oh, I can learn more about other people in my neighborhood, or um, you know, I can help the library out. Um, so a couple of responses uh, for interviewers. People mentioned meeting and learning about others through the interview process. People mentioned um, it's rekindled my interest in history and oral history and extended my knowledge of NYPL's wonderful programs, especially in the preservation of documents and genealogy. Um, another interviewer mentioned that they really loved hearing storytellers share incredible experiences without sounding preachy or formulaic. <laughs> um, storytellers mentioned that they really loved reconnecting with the community I grew up in, chance to tell my story to a sympathetic listener, feeling like a celebrity, 
I could give my voice to my Armenian grandparents and my dad. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about the third stakeholder in this project and the opportunities that ideally the project would give to them. Future researchers. So these are people, like many of you, um, who are really hoping to get something out of this material to learn about the, uh, the neighborhoods on a large scale. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of flip it to here, my research image. I've been very bad at uh, keeping up with the slideshow that I created. Um, but these are people like artists and educators and researchers who might even want to repurpose these oral histories for other various things that they're working on. Um, I mentioned in our previous session that all of our oral histories, with the exception of all of Jefferson Market and half of the Harlem collection, are CC0 Creative Commons license, which is a bit controversial and kind of an interesting decision. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but for future researchers, this could be of interest. Um, there's also uh, just this kind of large, previously undocumented point in time collection that's being created. We're asking people to share what it was like to move to the city, even people who moved here in the past year. Um, we've come to that point in the project where anybody can share their story. So um, let's talk about now, and you know, again, I just want to mention I could go into goals um, for this project. These are more opportunities that I just mentioned. Um, goals at the library are oftentimes metrics based, and so I'm not even going to go into that too much, but I will mention just kind of on a personal level, thinking about this large scale oral history and the amount of stories and you know, the amount of interviewers participating, all of these numbers become really, really important to prove that this program is a success. And I know that this kind of takes it out of um, thinking towards quality in some ways. And um, so at times, it, it's felt like a little bit of a different world of reporting. Um, so how do you kind of operate on this metrics-based, how many storytellers, how many people involved with what about this particular interview? Let's talk about these questions and, uh, and how they were asked. Really interesting challenge. Okay, the project itself. Um, so how did it start? Um, I'm gonna tell you a bit about the Jefferson Market Project. Um, and it started actually in the summer of 2013. Um, Jefferson Market is this beautiful building. If any, have any of you ever been to Jefferson Market Library? I'll show you an image. It's, oh. it's in an old courthouse. You might remember it. I think it's, or you might walk by it all the time. <laughs> um, so it's just this beautiful building with tons of history on its own. And they were having, uh, they have all sorts of really fascinating programs. Some of them last until one o'clock in the morning, really challenging the library's definition of the types of programs it offers. Um, but one particular day, they were having this program with a lot of longtime residents in the village. And they had photographs and building plans and business ledgers on the table. And um, one of these business ledgers had the Dorothy Lamore Hair Salon on it. And all of a sudden, everybody at this table started talking about their memories of this hair salon. I remember when I took my daughter there when she was super young. I remember walking by. I remember this one woman raised her hand and she said, I remember suing the Dorothy L'Amour hair salon. Yeah. They gave me a horrible bleach job back in the day. <laughs> um, so all of these stories kind of together at once on this table and it really sparked this idea in the librarians at Jefferson Market Library. You know what? Like This is pretty valuable. We didn't even have a reporter on the table. How can we do this at the library? Because People are sharing their stories all of the time. And I'd say that this is a universal experience at NYPL and probably libraries everywhere, is traffic is held up at the circulation desk and people are stopped sharing their stories. Um, so how did this idea turn into a project model? Basically, um, I came on board and I told everybody in the previous session about my background, um, but uh, basically, uh, worked with these librarians to think through a way that we could use this kind of grassroots model of oral history collection using volunteers um, in this way. And I wanted to make sure that these volunteers were trained, first and foremost. How do you train people to conduct oral histories? 
Um, I had done a fair amount of conducting oral histories and learning how to conduct them for the past several years before this. So it was interesting to kind of think about distilling all of that information into a way that was going to be manageable for people to pick up if they had had no oral history experience before. Um, but how do you also, how do you get people to these training sessions? So plan what I thought would be good to do at these training sessions, and then I reached out to people. And the people that I reached out to are people who care about their communities, where they hang out community boards, block associations, um, all of these kind of neighborhood institutions that have been around for quite a while. I reached out to all of them, and you know, when we asked people how they found out about the project at the end of it, 80% of people replied that they heard about it through a flyer, which is crazy to me, because we did put up flyers around the neighborhood, and we sent out tons of emails, but all this to say that flyers actually do work. I think it's kind of comparable to word of mouth in a way, because you're physically kind of confronted with this um, media in a space that you yourself are standing in and you trust, if that makes sense. Um, so at Jefferson Market, we had 70 people, over 70 people, sign up for these two training sessions. They were in a room that's probably about a third of the size of this room. So as you can imagine, it was quite packed. And I learned a lot at these training sessions initially. The first session, I wanted to pack everything I knew. I wanted to tell people how you conduct an oral history interview. Here's how you do it. I played tons of examples. I shared tons of information. I did a massive kind of just brain dump on the group. And um, luckily, I had a really good friend there who asked me afterwards, how do you think that went? <laughs> She's very polite. Um, and judging by just kind of a lack of response and the way that it felt leaving this group after, without anybody really asking any questions, and without anybody in this group really having the opportunity to share themselves, I decided that it would be a good idea for the second session to kind of show rather than tell. So I sat down, kind of revisited the drawing board, and the second session is very much like all of the sessions for the other projects ended up. Um, Questions came up um, that I thought were really interesting at the second session um, because I gave people the space to ask questions. We started out and I let everybody around the room share why they were interested in being there in the first place. That part took about 45 minutes to be honest, but that's okay. It got everybody kind of charged and excited. Um, and then I just played a couple of examples. I found this real gem of a clip of a bad oral history interview um, to kind of show people what an interrogation style dynamic sounds like. Um, and interesting questions came up that uh, I feel like I kind of probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> We do it that way from now on. Um, if I ask you if you grew up in, or if you are want to share your story uh, about Pelham Parkway, I don't ask you which street you lived on exactly because I just want to check. That's fine enough. Um, another thing that came up is people wanted to uh, ask, interview Matthew Broderick because he has all sorts of great stories to share. And so this kind of like celebrity chasing is a constant in all of these projects. You know, maybe I should interview this person because they have a lot to share. So, uh, you know, practice my own response. Um, well, this person always gets the chance to share. We need to interview people who are oftentimes uncelebrated. 
Uh, also, too, you probably have heard me use the word storyteller instead of narrator. This is because when I use the word narrator with a group of people who have never conducted, conducted oral histories before, um, there was a bit of confusion. And I found it coming up again and again. Well, does narrator mean that when you edit these oral histories, somebody comes in and does a voiceover? No. <laughs> so I just use storyteller to kind of bypass all of that. Um, another thing, after people left these trainings, they were given the opportunity to then come back to the library and check out a recording kit. I'm going to pass this around so you can kind of see what's inside. Um, hasn't really changed too much since this project. The only difference is the recorder we use, which is an H1 Zoom recorder. Big red button, really easy for a lot of people to figure out. So there you have it. Two training sessions, 70 people learned how to conduct interviews, and a small percentage of those people actually conduct interviews, but it takes a while. So a couple weeks passed, no interviews. And I was getting a little bit concerned. You know, what does this mean about this project? People weren't excited. And so I introduced the idea of a kickoff event, which is basically an opportunity for people to have another date in their calendar to know to come back to the library with the goal in mind of having one interview collected. So I'm going to play um, something that I played at this kickoff event at Jefferson Market Library, just to give you a sense of some of these early interviews that were collected, some of the questions that were asked, and the themes that come up. And honestly, a lot of these themes come up again and again in each of the neighborhoods. And I don't think it's just because people are asking the same questions I have in the handbook, although that might be, that might be part of it. Um, so here it is. Let me see. The Apollo Theater was my second home. Not that one. <laughs> Before I came to Greenwich Village, I was in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is kind of a conservative um, Irish Catholic situation, and I really didn't know much about the village. Um, I was I was um, in a one-room schoolhouse, which was just within walking distance uh, up the road from us. Um, Manhattan seemed like a far-off place when I was a kid. I would always say. Oh, I'm going to the city. Actually, I was born in Brooklyn and grew up in Brooklyn until World War II. In 1945, 1942, I was shipped overseas. Where I come from? I come from Vermont Village. And tell you the truth, I miss being there. So maybe we could start with Frank. And you tell us how you, um, you know, arrived in Greenwich Village. I got to get a experience when I came to Italy in 1938. The first time I came to the village was when I got kicked out of the seminary in Baltimore for being homosexual, non-practicing. I was asked if I was gay, <laughs> and I said I was. I didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, and I had never been to the West Village. And she invited me over, and I was walking around the neighborhood because I got there early. I said, this is a fantastic neighborhood. They had small stores. It wasn't high. You know, you could see the sky. The village, the, especially the West Village in the summer with all the trees in bloom. It was just, it was quiet. And it, it was like being in Europe. I just, I just loved it. I just, I said, oh, when I move into the city, I'm moving into the West Village. So I moved into the Albert Hotel at 10th Street and University Place. A very interesting hotel. What made it interesting? And well, uh, when I first got there, I didn't realize it was quite so interesting. Um, and we found our first apartment at 53 West 11th Street, which was distinguished by two things. One, 
It was the only building on the block with a fire escape. Oh. One day I came home and the staircase was gone. They had put some planks where the stairs loose. There were gaping huge holes in the floor. There was plastic holding back the dust. And it was, uh, it was a long studio, but the windows came exactly up to the North Park next door. There was absolutely no light. You would think that this would be almost forbidden, but it wasn't. And then I kept thinking, at the minute, a, uh, the ceiling's going to collapse. Finally, 30 years later, the ceiling did collapse. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's many other boroughs. There's above 14th Street. What, what about the uh, village well, has know, kept you here? Uh, I have to, well, first of all, the, the thing about the village is that it really is a village. Um, three blocks one way, three blocks the other way is a different neighborhood. And one of the things I love the most about this neighborhood is that you, you know, or the village, is that everybody I know knows their merchants. Like you do the guy at the hardware store. You can do the butcher at, at the other. Well, one of my favorite places was Comolo the Butcher on 6th Avenue next to what's now the IFC. And Comolo always had the best meat. And then next to that was, um, yes, there was the, veg the man that had the vegetable store not too far from where I lived. And I think, actually, I'm almost positive his daughter was my godmother when I was baptized. And there was this wild place on, on uh, Waverly Place. It was, a, it was actually a, a loft. And the smell was amazing. It was called the Bone Bazaar, and it was all burlap. On Braddock Street, there's the Tony Dappolino Rec Center by new Tony. Tony was this baker, and he was also the chairman of the community board. And he was sort of like the unofficial mayor of Greenwich Village. He was also the one person everybody liked and trusted. He'd come in the morning and he'd, and he'd make a little pepper biscuits and he'd call the borough president and he'd make deals and like solve the local problems and it was like local government at its best in the way. If you decided to retire, would you move to New York? Would you move to Village? Uh, I've, uh, where would I go? What would I do? Uh, I, I've often, I, if I go anywhere, I would go to Austin, Texas, but then I ask myself, what on earth would I do? They don't talk about the same things we do. But I think the village has its own character. And I think that's what keeps you young, Mr. Village. I don't think you can age in the village. Mm -hmm. So it's the only place to live. If you want to stay young, if you want to reach 200, stay in the village. <laughs> All right. And he was uh, 94 years old. Oh. So, uh, could help us move tables at the various events that we had. Um, so, how do you get all of these interviewers to feel like they already know how to do an oral history? Um, I usually ask the question at all of the training sessions. Um, have you ever sat next to a stranger, a friend, family member, and just listened? Nodded your head and listened? And everybody raises their hand for that question. Um, so I'd like to think that some people can put that back into action for this project. Um, you can hear by some of the questions that are being asked. They're not worried about perfect phrasing. They're very humanly approached. Um, some of the interesting themes that come up again and again, small businesses that are no longer around the city, um, what it was like moving to the city, first places that people lived. And then at the end, it kind of uh, ends in this like uh, advertisement for their neighborhood almost. You see a universal neighborhood pride. I'm serious. Even though people are uh, frustrated with some of the things that are happening now or in the past or at various moments in their neighborhood, they often come back at the end of the interview, most often times, to this feeling of neighborhood pride. Like, where would I go? I love it here so much. Um, so a couple of other uh, things. We did experiment with some public programs connected to this project that we did in other projects too. Um, John Straussbaugh, author, wrote a book about the village, actually connected people in his book to interviewers that I felt would, would make good matches um, for interviewing them. Uh, we also uh, tried out the concept of the memory circle. I know the story circle is kind of 
a bit of a unicorn in the oral history world. A lot of people are trying it and testing it out and, and figuring out new ways to go about doing it. And so um, this approach, we actually called the story circle at the beginning, and it was the community members that decided to change it into a memory circle versus a story circle. We uh, did a little skit at the beginning to show people kind of how to, how to step, back, step up and step back. Um, all of the things that you learned at one point in your life, but you might have to relearn as adults when you're sitting with other adults listening to their stories. And 16 millimeter films have become really, really popular in this project. Um, especially at this bridge in Harlem that I have here, or the branch in Harlem that I have here, McCombs Bridge, which is the tiniest branch in the library. It's like a studio apartment. And we just show the 16 millimeters on the wall with the books in the back. Um, so now I'm going to kind of transition into some of the things that happened um, in each of the different neighborhoods that were a bit of a surprise and kind of strayed from this model that I just described of recruitment, trainings, um, kickoff event, and boom, oral histories collected. So there were always surprises. Um, first of all, uh, in Harlem, there were the largest amount of new neighborhood residents. Oftentimes we have meetings that you know, were, were very, very tense with people who had lived in the neighborhood for a while and people who were new to the neighborhood. Um, we called those community meetings and they weren't always just on the topic of collecting oral histories. We also, um, in Washington Heights and Inwood, one interesting thing that happened is a lot of oral history projects had already been started in that community and we then figured out ways to bring those oral history projects into the NYPL collection if they were kind of collected along the similar lines of the community-based project. Um, one example is um, Benji uh, La Piedra. Is he here? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Stepped out. Oh, he stepped out. Well, he did an amazing, he made, had an amazing collection of oral histories he collected from Word Up Community Bookstore that were actually added to the Washington Heights Inwood collection. And um, we created a separate release form for that. So that was another exciting kind of challenge but surprise to come across. Like, wow, there's already a huge oral history community here. How do we incorporate that into this collection? One of the interesting things that came up in the Northeast Bronx in neighborhoods that, as far as I know, have never had large scale oral history projects <coughs> conducted around them, um, Helen Parkway, then Nest, Allerton, Morris Park. Uh, there were a lot of trust issues that came up. I spoke to a lot of people who were concerned about the release form and wanted to ask me questions as a project administrator. Um, what does this mean for their story? So that was something that was kind of unexpected. And as a way to uh, kind of like ease people's concerns but have them participate in a different way, we did memory circles that ended up, they were more popular in the Northeast Bronx than any other neighborhood. Um, this particular memory circle is a food memory circle in the Bronx. And actually, I just want to read a couple lines. My volunteer, Joanne, wrote a blog about listening to this memory circle. And she says, I'm sitting in a New York Public Library office annotating a memory circle focused on food from the voices of East of Bronx Park Oral History Project. As I listen to the recollections of seven Bronx residents, my own memories are triggered. My mouth begins to water, and I'm off on a culinary tour of sorts. Oh, what memories, the Chinese restaurants, the Italian restaurants, the sour dill pickles plucked from barrels of brine, 15 cent slices of pizza from triplets, and then it shifts to home cooked meals and favorite foods, stuffed artichokes, blintzes, roast leg of lamb, such wonderful memories of my own childhood, my annotating slows down. <laughs> um, we did another project actually that wasn't neighborhood based. Visible Lives, Oral Histories of the Disability Experience. I could do another one hour presentation on this project. Um, and this was amazing in so many ways because this was the project where community meetings, community advisory council, really, really took flight. There were 40 or 50 people oftentimes at these meetings helping us plan this project around the disability experience. Um, we also, it was the first project where we really entered into organizations around the city. 
who were interested in training their staff members um, to conduct oral history interviews. This is uh, United Cerebral Palsy. I conducted an uh, interviewer training with two people there who then trained two other people to conduct interviews, and they collected 60 interviews of people um, with cerebral palsy throughout their system. So this is an example of, so in Stapleton and Riverdale, we've had a little bit of trouble getting people interested. Um, you know, we do the outreach at the beginning, and these are one branch communities. These are very, very, uh, you know, dedicated to just this one location. And people just haven't responded. We have three or four people at these interviewer training sessions. And so the branch staff have taken it upon themselves to interview the patrons. They've been trained and they're excited to collect, and they know the people who they want to interview. And both of these collections have, they've, they've interviewed over 50 or 60 people for Stapleton and Riverdale, um, just kind of using that staff collected method. So another just couple of notes. Um, one of the other projects that we worked on recently um, was in Hell's Kitchen in Times Square. For those of you at the previous session, you remember I talked about my youth media interest. And this is an example of a project, um, you know, as a self-proclaimed perfectionist, always in youth media, teach a group of high school students or a group of adults, really, anybody in this project, to do an interview. And sometimes you're gonna hear things that, don't ask your question that way, that's a closed question. Um, but this is one of these examples of this project where these students really, really took so many of these suggestions to heart. They collected these interviews from Hell's Kitchen in Times Square, and they uh, kind of repurposed the material in various uh, documentary forms. So I'm actually going to try to play one of these videos for you now. I can bring it up. start it from after there's a long photo montage with a ton of music. We'll start <laughs> here. What year were you born? Well, I was born in 1980. I'm an 80s baby. I was born for making numbers. <laughs> uh, I was born in 75. Oh, wow. Well, I am 34 years old. drug dealers off the block. He would say, hey, you can't be around here because you being here, you know, could affect my family in a way that, you know, I, I could lose them. So he would literally say, you can, you want to go over there, go over there. You want to go to the, to that side of the street, go over there, but don't, you can't be on this block. Oh, back in the day, it was rough. It was rough out here as kids. It was up. Okay. I'm conscious of time, so I won't show the whole thing, but interesting to see how they kind of uh, incorporated their oral history content into these. And um, those collections are available on the website as well. And that's just an example, I guess, of also how I've had to learn how to be flexible from the original model. Honestly, at Jefferson Market Library, um, I wouldn't even really let people use their own recording devices um, unless I sat with them for a little bit and, and 
look them over. Um, so I guess it's not too different now. People can use their cell phones. Um, but back in the old days, I used to actually just require pretty much that people use library equipment. And I would run over myself, and I would upload audio myself, and I would do all of that. Um, and then I got tired, and then I realized that in order to create a sustainable project model, um, it's good to kind of delegate and um, allow people the opportunity to do what makes them feel comfortable in many ways. And sometimes that allowing people to do what makes them feel comfortable does compromise quality um, in ways that you have to ask yourself, are you okay with this? So people do use their cell phones to record interviews now. Um, and I require that it's done in high quality MP3 or WAVE. Um, but that's one of these uh, examples of, of how I've had to how to relax the oral history standards just a little bit in a community-based project. Um, on to this next part. Many of you are wondering, with all of these oral histories collected, how in the world are we going to make them searchable? Um, so this is a new uh, project that we started as part of this project called Together We Listen, a grant, prototype uh, grant from the Knight Foundation allowed us to do this. I worked with the digital library team on a um, model that would allow us to get a whole bunch of oral histories computer uh, transcribed through a computer, computer generated transcripts, um, and then people can go in and correct them. Humans and computers working together. So I'm not gonna go in to do a tool demo now, um, but I invite you up after, we'll probably have a few minutes and I can show you on this computer how this works. Um, we also have an annotation tool for the project where you can go in and you can listen and you can annotate various moments. And by you, I mean volunteers anywhere can get on and do this. Um, it's a crowdsourced consensus model. So the consensus piece kind of catches any potential issues related to human error. Um, or ideally, that's what it does. And basically what we learned throughout this process is people who conduct these oral history interviews are not the same people who are gonna be interested in this second phase work, this phase of making things accessible. This was a huge surprise. I was sure that when I sent a mass email to everybody who collected interviews and shared their story, we have these transcripts done. <laughs> um, but <laughs> since two people are needed to, uh, to verify each line, to agree on each transcript line, um, there are a whole lot of lines um, that need to be corrected, we didn't make it that far. But we did make some progress. Um, so you can see we've had 92,248 contributions, which is like 128 hours and 7 minutes and 20 seconds exactly. Um, just as an example, if you want to see some larger numbers, the people who are interested in the second phase are people who are interested in volunteering for volunteering's sake, essentially. People who want to kind of lend a hand to the library in this collection. People in corporate social responsibility groups um, who have like day-long volunteer sessions where people can jump on this tool and make a difference for two hours. Um, people who uh, are also in learning environments. We've had a lot of students who are interested in this and working with Gutman Community College right now on a day of community service dedicated to making this, um, making this collection accessible. So, we have a lot of people involved in this project at this point, right? I think I've mentioned, well, you know me, um, we have a ton of branch staff on the ground who are supporting the, the kind of like day-to-day -day ground operations by meeting people at the library and recording equipment checkout and all of that. Um, we have the Milstein Division for US History, Local History, and Genealogy, where the collection will eventually be kept in the repository. We have the Digital Library Team, um, the Communications Office, which helps make a large project like this um, palatable and shared story a bit more. Um, and then we have people outside of the library. We have many different types of volunteers. We have the interviewers, the storytellers, the office volunteers, Huge shout out to Caitlin McClure, who's back there, who is a dedicated office volunteer, as well as a field volunteer, as well as many other things for this project. Um, and these are the volunteers who are fine with the head down, metadata, um, making sure that the data sheets are entered correctly into the system's work. 
Then we have volunteer annotation and transcription groups, which I just mentioned. We have volunteer group facilitators that we called community ambassadors, where people we trained on these online tools to teach other people how to use them. We have community partners, we have local government officials who stop by at our events and say a few words and who are tapped into the project. So those are a lot of people. There are a lot of things that you can't control about a project with so many people involved, and I just want to emphasize that and go over some of these things and talk about some things that have kind of come up for me um, and are still questions. And I'd love to hear what you think about these questions, too. Um, so one of these key kind of uncontrollables is there's a service quality issue. When people go to a branch library where branch staff are doing a million things, and this is not their key concern, this oral history project, um, one of the biggest things coming out of the evaluation that we heard back from interviewers is that sometimes people didn't know what was going on on the ground. Um, there's this uh, recording equipment flexibility that I've introduced into the project, which I think helps that, so people can use their cell phones and other recording devices. They don't have to go to the library. But another thing that I'm introducing to hopefully help this is this new role of neighborhood leader, which is kind of like a bridge between where I am, um, my little cubicle in mid-Manhattan, and where branch staff are. Um, these are people who can directly interact with volunteer interviewers and storytellers and help kind of keep, keep it moving, help keep them engaged, and help with, and I, I'm really conflicted about this term, but I think it works here, the community service of the experience, uh, making sure that they're happy when they walk away. Um, so the other thing that has kind of come up as an uncontrollable is the release form. We talked a little bit about this in um, the meeting that we just had, but the idea that all of these oral histories are CC0 designated, that's huge. That means that anybody can use them for anything without permission, without citation. Um, this is a decision that the library uh, is moving towards because of our interest in making all of our digital collections, as many as possible, open and available to the public. Uh, but how do you communicate that to people? What do you say? How do I tell interviewers to tell narrators, this is the deal, this is what your story is going to be used for? And how do I make them feel comfortable for that? Obviously, I've experimented with many language that is going to tell it like it is, but also make people feel like this is, you know, potentially a good thing to do. Um, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. The other thing is the interview itself. I get three-minute interviews sometimes. <laughs> what happens with a three-minute interview? And what happens when people who come into this project, the number one thing that they want out of this project is a sense of community and uh, an understanding of the community that they're in. It doesn't have much to do with interview skills and recording equipment, you know, understanding of recording equipment and all of the other stuff that goes along with kind of that quality building of the interview. So that's a big challenge. Um, you know, people, people really, really want to connect with each other. When it comes to the one-on-one -on -one interview, um, there's been, and I'm not going to say it's, it doesn't happen all of the time. I think we have maybe like 23 minute interviews. So it doesn't happen all of the time. Um, I still post it, but my question for you, and I guess for myself, is trying to figure out how to phrase this. How do you instruct and encourage while maintaining the quality of your, your collection um, for people who are interested in participating but don't necessarily want that, that critique? My, my tendency is to think about building it into the beginning at the training session, letting people know this is what you're getting yourselves into. Um, and I think I'm really gonna try to do more of that as these projects come up in the fall. So the other thing that is a big consideration, and I still don't know how to answer it, is when is a collection finished? And this is something you ask in the oral history interview all of the time. When is it finished? Um, but there are so many uncaptured voices in many of the projects that we're working on. If you think about like, re really representing the demographic makeup of a community at any given time, um, there aren't enough Dominican voices in the Washington Heights and Inwood Oral History Project, even though it ended several months ago. 
So my way of feeling okay about moving on to the next neighborhood, I guess is twofold. Um, first of all, this is oral history that's part of public programming at the library. Um, we're not professing to say that we're gonna collect a community with all of its many varied voices all at once over these next six months. I'd like to think of it as a starting point. Um, I'd like to think about ways that community members can be trained to pick up the projects later on and to really look for those voices that are missing, um, given their deep understanding of the community that they're from, and to collect those. Um, so what's next? Well, there's a lot. Um, some of you asked how you can get involved. Um, the Lower East Side project and the Chinatown project and Kips Bay projects are coming up. I'll have trainings um, in the next couple of months. For the first time ever, I'm training people to lead these trainings. So neighborhood leader role, that's what's happening. Um, I also um, am excited about working with other local libraries who are doing these kinds of projects. Um, Brooklyn and Queens each have oral history projects, which you should definitely look into that are amazing. And whenever the organizers of those projects and I sit together, I'm constantly amazed by the strengths, the different strengths that we each bring to the table. Um, I've often found it difficult to build an audience for this project. I think that Brooklyn <coughs> has that down. Um, they're really, really good at editing highlights and putting them out there and really, really growing that audience. Um, if you ask me what one of the biggest challenges of this project is that is on my mind every day, um, it's really thinking about the ways that we can get people to listen to these oral histories now that they're up on the website. Uh, it was interesting with the Together We Listen project. Um, this is like a little bit of a tangent to what I was just talking about. But we wanted people to correct these transcripts for a collection which they had really no connection to. So we were putting this out to the public, we were launching it, we were saying go for it. But I think that we totally forgot about this, this need for an audience base in order to do that. And so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm excited to work on and consult with Brooklyn and Queens, how are they doing it. Queens involves images in their oral history project, which I find really interesting. Um, sometimes people will bring photographs to interviews, but we don't have any place to put them. Um, so really thinking about an outlet for those images um, to be part of this project is something that I'd love to learn from them. Um, okay, oh, neighborhood tours. That's another thing I'd like to work on. Thinking about other ways that the library can kind of build on the success of and the need that we've identified through this project of people learning more about their communities and teaching other people about their communities how can we create a volunteer neighborhood tour uh, program that would inspire people to do the same thing? Is that the next oral history project at the New York Public Library? Um, okay, that was a lot. Um, I hope that, I, I know that there are a million things walking over here that I'm like, I should have, I should have thought to put that down, and I'm sure I'm gonna think about that after I speak with you today, but your questions will hopefully bring up new stuff. Um, so I guess questions, yeah. So I have three questions, um, and I'm having trouble deciding which to ask first. So okay. we'll just ask all three, and then you can decide which one you want to answer. Great. Okay. So my first one is you talked briefly about um, like uh, how how you're quantifying success, or how the library is like yeah. quantifying success, like saying like X number of interviews in a certain area, or X number of transcripts, or number of mm -hmm. hours or whatever. Um, I was wondering if there are any impact indicators amongst that, like are you looking more broadly at the impact of the project on the community, um, so beyond like the output indicators, which, which are the ones that you mentioned. So that's my first question. Um, my second question is on transcribing, because we had this long okay. conversation in past the other day about like all of the different ways that you could transcribe an interview, like how would you transcribe like a dialect or how would you transcribe an accent that's like outside of like the mm -hmm. standard like NPR like radio accent? Um, and how do you how do you control that when you have volunteers? My third question is on volunteers. Do you find that like relying on volunteers at all limits uh, the people who participate? 
participate in the project because people of lower income perhaps don't have that extra time to volunteer for the project? Really great question. So the first Thanks. question, um, the impact question, I guess what I can say for that, I guess what comes the closest that we try to track is um, thinking about how sustained people's participation is in the project. Um, I'd like to track actually at which point other people kind of find out about the project and jump onto the project. I'd also like to track who is clicking on these oral histories. Are they from the communities of the people that we've recorded interviews from? Um, where are they listening from? Um, and I know that that information is available uh, somewhere. Our digital team has it, but um, I would like to think about tracking that a little bit more closely. Um, second question, trans, that's a, that, that, that is a question that I definitely had on my list here and just kind of glossed over. Um, so yes, we actually, the computer generated transcript companies and spaces where people get those from um, oftentimes don't work with other languages outside of English. Um, and also for a United Cerebral Policy Collection, um, thinking about people who have speech patterns that aren't recognizable by the computer software um, and could actually be insulting if we put them up uh, in whatever form they take as transcripts on the website. So that's something that we're gonna be paying transcriptionists to do um, those interviews, and uh, I actually budgeted that in this year, um, knowing what I know now about the computer-generated transcripts. Um, third question, remind me. We're talking about they're relying on voluntary cell limits of participation to people of, of like medium or higher income. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I try to. One of the things I do try to do for the volunteer trainings is. We, we all know the library sometimes has ridiculous hours for working people. Like, if you want to go to an event after the library is closed, um, it's really, really difficult to make it to that. Um, so if you have a day job and you know other things, other commitments that you need to be at at particular times, that's definitely a consideration. I require that all of the branches I work with stay open after 6.30 for these training sessions. Um, and then I also have Saturday training sessions. And if people can't make these sessions, they contact me directly and I figure out ways that they can get involved. Um, I usually send them the interviewer handbook because it can kind of stand on its own. And I have conversations with them, them on the phone whenever it works. But that's still, I mean, there's still an effect. It depends on how people hear about the project too. Like who's visiting the library homepage, who's going to the locations where these flyers are posted. So I'd really like to continue to think in a more conscious way about how people are finding out about this and the spaces within the community where you know, people aren't finding out about it. Hey, um, so we were talking about different ways to engage the community um, with these oral histories. And, and I think you're right on about um, the Brooklyn Library branch, like having that stuff built in. And the Queens one incorporating photos. But the New York Public Library has like one of the largest photo archives, like kind of anywhere, right? And um, yeah. and you guys also have a film archive that includes 60 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. And just based on the success of some of those programs that you showcased, that I I think you guys have a ton of neighborhood footage for a bunch of different neighborhoods. I know that you guys are really open until six o'clock, but for mm -hmm. public programming, I think that engaging the community would mean weekdays after six and maybe that would be the way to do it and create spaces where um like tonight's a pop-up and tonight or for this week, between the hours of like 6 and 8 p.m or 6 and 9 p.m you can um use like hyper-directional uh audio photos and you know so that it, people come out for experiences but mm -hmm. if they don't need to if you can have the same fidelity of audio you know at home you know what i mean Mm -hmm. So I think that it can be um, curated thematically, maybe. So it's like, okay, so we're going to have this neighborhood, but like specifically what's exciting about this neighborhood, and like, right? you did the local businesses. Because I think that that's a really brilliant kind of way of framing it. You can incorporate food and stuff like that, and, um, and you know, we're going to shop all these people. I think yeah. people would really um, come out if they could have a time capsule of like the neighborhood before, and you can build that inside your spaces, because you own them. 
love, I love that. They're hired. There's, um, somebody might remember the name of this uh, better than I can right now, but post presentation brain, but um, Metropolitan Library Council, is that what it's called, Metro New yeah. York? Um, um, they actually uh, worked with Brooklyn Public Library on getting funding for digital scan, good digital scanning equipment. Yeah. Um, and they brought these scanners to different locations and people could bring photographs and then these photographs were put on Metro's uh, site. Mm -hmm. At the library, there are uh, a lot of restrictions um, that are sometimes chalked up to like staff time um, yeah. around like, vetting images that could be put in our photo collections officially. The most amazing thing would be if we could create a whole other site or connect uh, something connected to this site where people could could add photographs. Um, mm -hmm. We could include that as part of the pop-up. Um, but thinking about a pop-up that incorporates audio and, and you know, bringing in small business owners and other people is kind of just like a like a, a rush of, of bring your stuff and we'll make it available and we'll keep it here. Question. I don't know if you mentioned this, but as you branch out to other neighborhoods, Chinatown and other, are, are, will there be multi-lingual parts of this yes. to draw people in and make it the center point of the community? Yep. So in Chinatown, we're actually partnering with an organization, well, not organization, another project um, called the NYC Chinatown Oral History Project. It was started by a professor at Delphi University. And she's been working to collect oral histories in that neighborhood for a couple of years now. A lot of memory circles, actually. She's been experimenting with that approach. Um, so a couple of students that she works with are going to be co-creating these training sessions with me. Um, simultaneous translation is being offered. They're reaching out to people through their, their networks. I would say this is the most kind of organized and concerted we've been um, with an effort to make sure that we have You, you said you would have a lot to say about the disability project. Yes. And I just would love to hear a little bit more yeah. about it. You know, one thing that some of our uh, students and the alumni have been thinking about here is sort of what, how do our traditional oral history methods limit accessibility and limit like what counts as a life story and who gets to have a life story and who gets to tell one, um, particularly where people have limitations in terms of um, oral language. And so I just want to hear more about how all of that has fit into the project design for that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, first of all, the project was based out of Inner High School Braille Talking Book Library. So the majority of participants were um, visually impaired or blind. And we wanted to make sure that all of our recording equipment was accessible. Um, so we used, I don't know the exact model, but they were with this recorders um, with uh, voice guidance um, so that it was easier to record world histories in their community. Um, and then, you know, one of my biggest regrets in that project is we really didn't capture too many stories from um, the deaf community in the city. And going back to that project, and I still consider it very open-ended, I'd love to do that, and I'd love to think through the ways that that could be possible. Um, at all of our events and our community meetings, um, we had something with CART and ASL, ASL and um, a lot of participants who were deaf or hearing impaired who took part in those sessions. Um, but the actual interviews themselves, um, we, we didn't make it to that, unfortunately. So you were speaking about volunteers. Um, to me, it's really amazing the number of volunteers you have on this project. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, thinking, in my own, from where I came from, is there anything that you have used as a source of motivating these people to come out to volunteer for these projects? So, the, so the, the question is like techniques and kind of ways that I've gotten people motivated to collect. That's a question. Just like to participate. Or participate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think that the number one thing. This is something I mentioned briefly that, and this is just totally off the top of my head, this is what I think about an effect, is creating a space where people feel like it's within themselves to collect an oral history interview, like they already have the basic kind of skills associated with it, and 
they have sat and they've listened to relatives before. We've all done it. We've all been in that space. Um, so it's really just taking that feeling and recording this person that you're listening to and being really active in that listening. Um, so I think that that's helped. And I think also creating just like a low threshold to participation in, in other ways. And that has its benefits and its downsides, definitely. Um, a question was asked in the previous session, how do I vet interviewers? Um, but I'd rather just kind of welcome everybody with open arms to these first sessions. Um, and maybe because this is like so library appropriate, but um, really, really making people feel like, oh, I could spend two hours of my time learning how to conduct an oral history interview and hearing more about this project. Um, the part at the beginning where people go around and talk about why they're here, sometimes if it's raining or snowing out, even better, they say, why are you even here in the snow or the rain? This is crazy. And I think that people's energy just collectively kind of comes together around that feeling of like, okay, like, we really care about this neighborhood. And you know what, we're seeing a lot of things leave it that we really, really care about. And now's the time, and that sense of urgency. Um, it depends on what you're creating your project around, but if you can create that sense of urgency. Um, I sometimes also describe the oral history project. It's like each of these neighborhoods is its own miniature campaign of sorts. It's six to seven months, you know? We've tried a more open-ended approach. Actually, I forgot to mention that in Harlem, it was more open-ended, and we really had a difficult time collecting interviews at the beginning. Um, I mean, it could be for a lot of reasons, but part of what I attribute it to is that we weren't, we were saying, oh, we're just starting this, you can come and collect interviews whenever you want, but it wasn't like, <laughs> by the kickoff event, we'd love to have you collect this many interviews, and then by the end, six months later, let's all imagine a project together, that kind of collective visioning process where everybody becomes a project designer. Like, what does this project look like at the end? I think is really also um, important. Um, so first of all, this is like, I'm so glad to see this uh, come like, to full information. Um, and, and I'm wondering, have you, did you ever, in say like the thousand, like the 1200 interviews that you collected, or that the volunteers collected, encounter any, I guess like contentious language or stories? So I'm thinking either like a particular resume gets singled out as like the awful landlord, um, or um, I don't know, someone in the interview feels okay going on some kind of racist tirade. I don't know, like are there, like did you ever have to kind of push the button to like cut things out that you wouldn't want to spend online or that you wouldn't want accessible in the archive? It's um. a really good question. So the thing that's come up most often around that question, um, and by the way, I just want to back up a second. What I tell people to do um, at the training sessions is flag interviews that they think I might need to know about when it comes to those things, all the things that you mentioned. Um, I don't say that I'm gonna edit it out or like take it down, and I don't. Um, although, obviously we do the thing where if somebody mentions something they wish they hadn't mentioned and they bring it up, then we can we do edit it out if they want it. Um, but for this particular question, the thing that we've gotten the most, um, the thing that people have flagged the most, is when um, community members talk negatively about other community members, like new groups of people moving into the neighborhood, I don't like how my neighborhood is changing and it's because of these people, that kind of conversation. Um, I don't edit it, but I just think it's interesting to know that that's what comes up as being something that people are flag that, that people are flagging for me. Yeah. And do you, sorry, do you, do you use that as like, like what do you do with that? Like do you let it just live in the archive? Like do you use it as a chance to conduct some kind of or I'm sure, obviously it's a very challenging conversation to have, but if that, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if that can be used as like uh, fodder for some kind of teachable moment. Yeah, totally, totally. So I actually keep a spreadsheet of interviews that have been flagged mm -hmm. um, for me, and I think that that's a really great use for those. Um, it kills me sometimes because there are so many amazing teachable moments in these interviews, and I wonder how people are going to find them. And I wonder, like, in terms of something like that, like, how am I going to get the word out about those things to people who 
I don't even know how they're interested. Obviously, like my bandwidth to create programming and discussion around something like that in the immediate isn't here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say that that's like, it'd be great to create a system later on for people to pick that up. And it will be annotated. So people will be going in and, and annotating it. Um, I'm instructing to people, people to kind of annotate more along thematic lines um, so that, you know, whatever kind of keywords people are looking up that connect themselves to those types, types of conversations can pop up. Do you have any sense of how people are using the collection so far? Like, I know you said you wanted to track some parts of that a little bit more, but like, yeah. what are people saying? I mean, because it's CC0, it makes it much harder yeah. to know because, I, and I have another question about that, but let's start with that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, We've had a lot of people use it for educational purposes. Um, and this is honestly just for people that I've heard, you know, who have connected with me. They use it in a classroom setting, um, at a college level, at a high school level. Um, let's see. We've had people, so there are specific parts of the world histories. If there's like a, an NPR segment or a radio segment where they're doing something around a particular neighborhood, they will ask our press office for specific bits, so I hear about those. Mm. But I think you're totally right. Like it's kind of, to be honest, the CC zero thing is a really interesting um, situation because I would love to know how people are using them and putting up that initial kind of barrier in a sense, which isn't really a barrier, more just like a door you have to open to ask to use this thing. Um, if that were there, I, mean, I would be able to have a much longer answer to that question. I'm curious too, like I, when I was archiving my oral histories, the archive initially asked me to use a CC0 license and I changed it to ask for just attribution. And because, you know, one of the things that we worry about in the field with the oral history online is that you can take people's words so easily out of context, but generally you at least then like have a reference back to where they came from. Mm -hmm. um, but with the kind of license that you have here, people can take anybody's words, not even not even attribute them to the person who said them, let alone your project. Like, does, yeah. how do you like how do you feel about that? To me, that seems to be hard to square with some of the like basic values of oral history. Yeah, it is, um, and uh, you know, it's definitely something that was a big discussion at the library. There were a lot of people involved in this conversation, um, and I was one voice, um, I, I feel that, I feel like it takes something away from the people who committed to this project in the first place, if you want to know my personal feeling on it. Um, and I think that it's as hidden as possible on the oral histories. Like, if you actually click on an oral history, and I'm gonna just do this for you right now so you can see the wording that we use. Um, and this is kind of what makes it like a little bit more bearable for me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go for visible lives. So if you click on somebody's oral history, um, this is what it looks like, by the way. This is our website. But here, um, there is a right statement. And so anybody looking to use these knows that they can use them, but there's no option to download them. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that they can figure out a way to, to strip the audio if they really want it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of those things that I'm gonna kind of leave in place as a way for people, if they really want that raw audio file, they will have to go through my desk at least. That's not a, a, a long answer to your question. Yeah. This is the annotation tool that we have, by the way. It's something that I kind of mentioned a couple of times. Um, and then this is the form of the transcript tool down here. One of the things I'd like to add is a little bit uh, better wording than this transcript. <laughs> they contain errors, because um, there are some pretty glaring errors down there. But yeah, I really love the uh, crossing borders, bridging generations. 
thing that you have to click through to understand that you're listening to somebody's story and kind of honoring that listening and then want to try to figure out a way to build something in like that here because it's not obvious. So has any of this audio been used on podcasts or radio programs? Yeah, um, so I'm trying to think recently. You know, it's interesting. That's like one of the biggest surprises of this project is we really like haven't received a lot of press coverage at all. Um, there were initial stories as it was first kind of rolling out, um, but it's oftentimes hard, I think, for people who are interested in sharing the story of this story to digest, just because you get to this big page of oral histories and how do you even start? Um, so there's still a little bit more to do to tell the story. Um, has it been any radio pieces recently? Sure it has. They used a clip of something from one of the village uh, stories on NPR about like the village back in the day, in the 60s, um, which is interesting. And I can't think of anything about the topic right now. So the web page is completely uncurated. In other words, I see it, yeah. it looks like it's alphabetical. Yeah, yep. I've it's also got that um, your Instagram page doesn't mention it anywhere, and I feel like that might be a really good <laughs> oh, <to use>. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I think the way that I find out what's happening at the library is that I oh. see, I mean, because it's event based, you know, and yeah. if you have stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but I think That's that great. maybe what um, might be helpful is to have. It turned it a little bit so that featured stories where it's like you listen to something, you play the audio, and you're like, holy cow, this person says that they know feel feel JFK. Um, <laughs> like maybe that should be like bugs with the top a little bit. I don't know, not to privilege, but like you know, continuously <laughs> highlight. Totally. Um, so I'll show you kind of like a comparable feature that we have that we just added mm -hmm. because of that this very same kind of thing, like how do you surface stories that should be listened to immediately. Um, I could do a better job at switching these up, but every time you reload this page, those highlights will will switch. So there are probably about 20 rotating highlights here that people can kind of grab and listen to. Um, yeah, which, I mean, ideally would entice people to go in and listen to the whole interview, um, which isn't edited, except maybe a little bit at the beginning and a little bit at the end when people have setting up recorder issues. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is kind of the closest thing we have to that. I like the Instagram idea. I need to figure out who manages that at the library. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's really been so neat to hear about this, and I can't just wait to see how, where it goes as it spreads all around the world, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. And um, if you want to check out any of it, Thank you. If anyone is not on our mailing list and would like to be, the sign-up sheet went around and I'll bring it back up here. I think it's back there. Um, thank you all so much for coming. We have a week break now where we all head out to Long Beach, California for the Oral History Association annual meeting. Um, but we'll be back in two weeks in this room. So um, if you want to stay part of this conversation, please feel free to keep coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.